Okay, well, we'll get started. Um, people will probably continue to join over the next couple of minutes, but uh, why don't we make a start? Uh, first of all, let me introduce myself. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Paul Linden. I'm the principal investigator on the TAPAS project. TAPAS is tackling air pollution at school and it's a, a network um, uh, funded by the Natural Environment Research Council here in the UK. Um, and our goal is to investigate uh, air quality in schools and the impact of uh, external air pollution um, on the internal environment and to some extent and vice versa. We're organized into a number of focus areas um, and you can find the information about those on the website. I think the important thing to say is that it is a network and we're open. Um, we would like people to participate as much as they are able. Um, and Kat is our network manager, is on the call um, and the uh, her contact information is there. So if you are not connected to us and would like to be, please send her an email. We'll send you a newsletter and um, you can be as involved as your time and energy allows. So we are running a series of lunchtime seminars, and this is uh, the current one today uh, is about uh, air cleaning air filters in schools and the uh, Corsi Rosenthal Thomas Box. Um, and it's going to be, uh, we're having several speakers uh, over the course of the next uh, 45 minutes. Uh, we're going to start off with Dr. Reese Thomas, who's a consultant anaesthetist. Uh, and was the co-founder of the Wales Air Ambulance. Um, he has been very heavily involved in developing the UK version of this uh, air filter. Um, and uh, he is um, uh, the winner of the UK Vent Challenge Virtual Hospital and Clean Air. So Rhys, over to you. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, so over to you. Well, can I just say in housekeeping while Reese is getting his screen sorted up, is that please turn off your cameras and mute yourself uh, while the presentation is happening. Please put questions in the chat uh, and I'll moderate those uh, at the end of, the, of each of the talks. So. Right. Thank you very much indeed. An absolute honour to be uh, invited to come and speak to you here today. Um, so both myself and Stefan are going to do a bit of a double act today, telling you a bit about our story from Wales and our experiences and the challenges we've had and, and some of the successes we've had as well. So um, as was correctly said, um, so um, I'm a consultant anaesthetist, um, but my background is a bit interesting is that I've spent the majority of my career um, as a doctor in the military. Um, I got a MD PhD at DSTL Corton Down. Um, I understand pathogens and how to defend against them quite well from that experience really. So, um, so that's helped really. So when COVID came around, I, I understood really what was involved and how to um, manage this because obviously um, in biological containment labs um, we use HEPA filtration and UVC devices you know to be able to keep the pathogens under control so um, so here we go um, all right okay um, next slide okay and uh, this is the little um, device I um, created for the UK ventilator challenge and uh, yeah we won it we won it along with UCL um, for the Ventura device, which was uh, interesting enough that they didn't actually invent any new device, actually. It was just a, uh, they brought a mothballed, uh, an old mothballed 50-year-old uh, design back to life again. Um, but ours was a completely new device, and it was designed as a biological containment um, against any pathogens, really. So it was made of all antiviral um, um, materials, um, and it was, it was incredibly good at delivering oxygen, despite not having that much oxygen going into it. So um, yeah, we, did, we had fantastic results from our clinical trial. Um, we missed the timings quite for the first wave because of paperwork of the MHRA in the UK, but to, um, our clinical trials we did in Bangladesh uh, proved that it works very, very well, actually, and uh, we saved a lot of lives out there. So anyway, so um, that was that was how we initially so um, my company so challenged just initially, um, but then we started thinking about oh my god, 
schools and hospitals. Um, yeah, they haven't got any protection whatsoever against this and the children need to be educated. Um, likewise, patients need to be treated as well. So how are we going to try and prevent this? And you know, they, they are the major reservoirs of COVID. You, know, you take those two um, reservoirs of COVID and COVID itself could be a, actually a pretty manageable disease, really. So, um, but anyway, so the, I use these guidelines really for, um, for my thoughts about how to design a device which is suitable for schools. Right? The, the Lancet Commission, uh, COVID-19 Commission, absolutely amazing document. Uh, Richard Hammond just pulled it out of the bag, uh, really good. And it, all the evidence from that was actually true for pre-COVID, you know, and um, we, um, it was just, it was just so nicely presented and it showed that, you know, um, even pre-COVID with good clean air, children um, miss a lot less school, you know, up to six weeks a year uh, on average. Um, and that over a lifetime in school, that's, that's the difference between passing or failing exams. You know? so, so go figure. And that's just from um, cleaning the air pre-COVID. And of course, we know with COVID, you're going to miss a lot more schools than that. So it's even more true now with COVID and it, COVID being an airborne disease. But the Joint Union of, of Teachers um, document as well was a, a, a brilliant document, very straightforward document, and actually it debunked a lot of the rubbish, which is people uh, furiously washing hands, but uh, avoiding cleaning the air where, uh, with an airborne agent, go figure. Um, so, and that said about, you know, yeah, yes, washing hands is important, but actually the, the pathogen, the disease is in the air. So it's the air you need to treat. And it went back and supported the, uh, the Lancet document and the w, WHO and everywhere else. Because so, there's only two technologies that are supported for cleaning um, the air. Um, one of them is HEPA filtration. Uh, HEPA filtration has been around since the 1940s. It came out of the Manhattan Project from the need to be able to clean um, pathogen, uh, not pathogens, but radioactive alpha particles from the air. So that's how the uh, HEPA filtration was, uh, was initially came out of. But of course, UVC has been around for a lot longer than that. UVC actually won the first its Nobel Prize for medicine back in 1903. So it's been around for 120 years, you know, avidly killing pathogens left, right, centre. You know, um, the fact that we got a TV under control has actually um, been put down to the use of UVC in the sanatoriums we had. Um, all these things that we've forgotten and, um, and we're struggling to relearn these lessons uh, from the past. Okay, so uh, so we started designing, me and my children started designing because I could see with the politics and stuff that um, we were gonna find difficulty getting us through the government, getting us supported by the government and the local authorities. So the only way I thought about this, the children's gonna have to, they're gonna have to save themselves. So how are the children gonna be able to save themselves? And uh, even their parents were reticent to do anything as well. So. They literally had to be able to build them themselves. So um, luckily enough, I had a couple of volunteers and we went about um, to create a device which we think um, could be useful for us uh, with COVID. Um, we started small and worked up. Um, uh, so um, the, what, what is important is, is that you, you know, we're able to have very good filters which delivered the cleaning to the level required and I'm going to let Stefan talk about all about that to you but also I, I wanted a, a fan as well which would be able to clean um, to the level of um, incompetence if, I, if, I, if I'm be honest with you because um, you, you can't depend on anything really um, but what we what we need to be able to do is provide six at least six air room circulations an hour so if you get one of these devices would it be able to clean six air room circulations for the average classroom of 150 meters squared? That was the challenge I wanted to do. Um, so um, anyway, so tough challenge. I'll be able to do all, all to be able to do all that and to be able to be built easily and safely um, by a six-year-old. How are we going to do this? Right. Okay, so Stefan, um, I, I think now is a good time for you to come into it, really, and um, talk about your stuff, really, about the filters, the fans, costs, noise, and all the engineering work behind it. Okay, um, uh, should I, uh, how do I uh, access the video? Should I just leave, uh, talk? Yeah, 
Yeah, I, 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 do you want me to, I'll just control the screen, you tell me. Um, okay, so um, a little yeah. bit of background on myself first, um, uh, just so people that don't know where I've come from. I'm, I'm a, an industrial engineer and um, my background is in um, diesel fuel systems and uh, flow measurement, um, specifically uh, characterizing um, flow measurement errors and designing um, test equipment for production. Um, and uh, at the end of um, last year, uh, we started um, an international collaboration within the World Health Network um, across Europe and America in order to try and um, develop a device that was uh, cost effective um, outside of America for um, the UK and the EU. Um, this involved a, a lot of um, testing, hundreds of tests and different um, configurations in order to um, uh, hit sort of design targets uh, that we'd outlined early on in terms of um, the um, required cater and um, cost efficiencies of the device for them to make sense here. Um, and then uh, Dr. Rhys Thomas has uh, then taken that further in terms of um, optimizing it a bit further and um, in terms of costs and availability and the flow rates. Um, so um, this chart shows um, a breakdown of uh, the CADA uh, of different options. I think it's trimmed a bit on the screen top and bottom, but um, you can see the um, names of different uh, units along the bottom. Um, on the far left, you've got the device um, that um, is being built in the UK school, uh, in um, the school of Dr. East Thomas currently. Um, and then we've got the uh, US device, um, if it was built here, uh, for comparison. Um, I've included um, the uh, purifiers off the school list that was recently released uh, for the Dyson and the Camphill. And a couple of other units, uh, that are, such as the Philips, that was a 3000i in the Bradford trial, um, and the Levoit H133, which has uh, been used in their school as well. Do you mind explaining what CADA is? Ah, sorry, apologies. Um, so the CADA is the flow rate through um, an air cleaner, air purifier, um, is defined as the f uh, flow rate times the uh, filtration rate for a given particle size. Uh, so it's how quickly um, it can clean the air. Um, essentially, um, it's, so, uh, it changes. So, it depend, so it's particle size dependent in some way then? Uh, yes, yes. So um, the uh, filtration rate of um, each filter is um, dependent on the particle size. And um, when you look at uh, retail air purifiers, um, they'll be uh, judged by different scales. So you'll have um, a dust cater, a smoke cater, um, so smoke cater starts um, up to um, one micron, um, and then you've got dust cater according to the AHAM scales. Uh, it's 0.5 microns um, up to 2.5, I believe, uh, or up to three, and then um, pollen cater for the large, larger particle sizes. Um, is that why most... we're seeing? That's why we're seeing three bars on these. Um... Uh, yeah, sorry, it seems to have uh, trimmed off the legend off the top of here. Um, I could share my screen with the full size chart if that would help. Uh, it's okay if you just say it's fine. I think. Yeah. But... So uh, the light screen bar is the smoke cater. So all of these other devices, uh, being HEPA units, um, typically H13 or above, uh, will be 99.9% um, .9 filtration across um, uh, down to the uh, most penetrating particle sizes down into the smallest uh, particles below one micron. Um, for the DIY units, uh, because they use um, HVAC filters, um, they have a lower filtration rate at the smaller particle size. So I've included the light green bars here which is uh, uh, representing um, one micron and below. Um, this is taken from um, the EPM1 rating um, for the ISO rated filters that we're using on the UK spec. Um, and then um, you can see it for the US spec from their um, MERV ratings. Uh, the large green bar is essentially the PM2.5 um, or dust cater. Um, also uh, defined by Professor Javier Balser as a ferricader for um, uh, so filtration rate uh, for respiratory aerosols, uh, which he has a report that can be accessed online as to how that's been defined. Um, they're essentially uh, the, the same uh, between those three uh, values. Um, so in terms of uh, aerosols, uh, that's what the green bars are trying to compare. Um, the difference between the blue and the green on here is the difference between the max speed and the um, cater at below 50 decibels. Um, so uh, all purifiers have multiple speed settings. Um, above 50 decibels, they get quite uncomfortable to be nearby. 
um, so uh, not really suitable for an environment um, where you're trying to communicate. Um, it's okay for busier environments where there's a lot of background noise, but you need to be below 50 decibels really for um, uh, the use in a school case. Um, that was one of the primary design targets of uh, the DIY devices. Um, some of the devices on here, like the um, Smart Air ones, uh, are below 50 decibels at the um, uh, rated output, uh, but most devices are uh, usually need to drop the speed down um, to um, one or two levels in order to get down to those sound levels. Um, this is one of the main problems with the um, retail air purifier market that is quite difficult for people at the moment uh, because they have ratings of the um, CADA at the max speeds. Um, but they really show the um, decibel and cater at the lower speeds. And this is something I've been working with uh, the Clean Air Stars uh, website uh, or, or since uh, January, trying to figure out the um, relative differences in terms of the sound and flow rate for air purifiers where it's not declared. So uh, that's where some of the data sources have uh, come on here for um, the two units on the right hand side. Um, and then uh, you can see for the DIY devices, we've got quite a stark difference between um, the maximum flow rate on the blue line and um, the uh, flow rate uh, filtration rate at um, below 50 decibels. Uh, so when, when I was uh, looking at optimizing these devices, um, we looked at the minimum speed uh, typically of a fan um, so that it was uh, simply a case of turn it on and it has to be um, below the speed target. Um, that's partly a, it's a, for uh, plug and play. Um, didn't want to be declaring the maximum cater as the uh, rating of which um, it's going to be sized for a room. Uh, make sure that it was um, sized according to you know, the sound output. Um, so that uh, that's, uh, you can see here as well, uh, in terms of the difference between the um, US and uh, UK spec, um, there is quite a, a jump up um, in terms of the um, filtration rate through the units. Um, and this is part of the optimization work that has been done in order to um, uh, make the uh, costs make sense and in order to achieve uh, the flow rates necessary for high air exchange rates in um, a larger uh, space such as a school environment. Um, most of the retail units you see on here are, are quite a lot lower, especially at the um, below the, on the green bars for below 50 decibels. Uh, typically means that you're going to need uh, two or three units without any other form of ventilation um, to uh, get up to high air change rates. Um, you need to get up to around 900 or 1,000 um, to get to five to six air changes uh, per hour when you're at around um, 150 meters cubed um, as an assumption for a classroom. So uh, the aim with the UK DIY device was to try to achieve that uh, within one unit um, at a reasonable price point uh, with components that are available locally rather than um, imported from the US. Um, there are uh, some retail units on here that um, come close to that. Uh, the Smart Air Blast and Blast Mini um, have good performance. Um, more expensive to buy, uh, but an example of units that get close to um, achieving that with one unit. Um, but most of the other units on here, um, you would need to have multiple. Uh, we've tried to exclude um, any air purifiers on here that have ionizers um, yeah, or UV uh, inside so that um, there's no um, unknown chemical byproducts uh, produced by the reactions with ions in the air. Uh, so this is uh, this list is meant to try and uh, represent the uh, best alternative retail options versus um, DIY uh, for a direct comparison. Um, in terms of the uh, initial cost, you're talking about £100. And on this slide, uh, we've got the... Um, uh, from the if we move over to the next slide now, it helps um, scale it a bit uh, better. Um, so th this is showing how much flow rate you get for how much you're spending. Um, so how much investment do you need to put in um, to get the filtration rate? Um, that's um, a useful metric in order to understand how many, uh, how much you have to uh, spend in order to um, get up to the required air change rates. Um, I've included uh, the sound ratings as well for each unit. Um, and these are at the uh, below the 50 decibel level um, of flow rate settings for each unit. Um, 
as you can see with the um, DIY unit, there's um, quite an economy of scale. Um, this is partly uh, due to using the larger filter panels and um, an 18 inch fan. Uh, the US uh, design is also um, pretty cost competitive, uh, but you can see if you evaluate it um, at the smallest particle sizes versus some of the retail units, uh, it doesn't necessarily make uh, sense to use that uh, versus some of the other options that are out there. And this was part of the challenge with the um, uh, collaboration between the EU, uh, UK and America was to um, optimize the design in order to um, get these economies of scale in terms of the flow rate versus cost at the um, required sound levels. Uh, so I think that's about it. Uh, is there another slide? Ah, yes. So um, this is a, a performance estimate I've tried to put together um, to show the performance at um, different particle sizes. Uh, the you can see the different speed settings. Um, in reality, we expect the unit to only ever be run on speed one, um, and you'd leave it at a fixed speed. Uh, and the, you can see the um, overall flow rate. And then the um, I've, uh, in blue, we've got the um, filtration efficiency for respiratory aerosols that um, uh, uh, Professor Javier Ballester has proposed, um, and that could be accessed. Uh, the definition of that could be accessed in um, the report he's got uh, uh, on the the CADA test link uh, shown there. I've also included uh, estimates for the um, different particle ranges as defined by AHAM. Um, there are other particle ranges that we could use, such as the um, ASHRAE filter particle ranges or um, the uh, uh, ISO um, filter spec, uh, EPM1, uh, EPM 2.5s. Uh, the reason I've included AHAM is because of the comparison with uh, units available retail uh, to try and provide the fairest direct comparison between them. Um, I've also included a 75% a, a uh, value on the right hand side um, for reduction over life. Um, and this is to try and show that uh, as part of the design, uh, it's intended to have uh, an overhead in terms of CADA so that uh, it should hopefully gra uh, age gracefully. And this is based off um, look uh, the um, the uh, aging of um, the DIY units in the US over a six month plus period. Um, okay, uh, you can see that we're using um, on the UK builds, uh, we're using um, ISO 16, um, uh, 670, 870, I think it's uh, EPM1, 55% um, rated F7 panels. Um, there is a distinct difference between the uh, international standard used in the EU and the UK uh, versus the MERV uh, filter panels used in the US. Uh, the test standard uh, involves a check um, where the uh, filter is aged um, by um, removing uh, the uh, static filtration on it. Um, so, uh, so I should explain this better. So, uh, on the, the US uh, move panels rely on um, uh, a static charge impregnated in the panel, um, and that can decay over time. Um, as part of the ISO standards, that static charge is removed, and then the average of the new and removed uh, performance is taken for the particle filtration rate, um, and that's to try and represent the. Uh, uh, filtration rate of the filter over um, its entire lifespan now um, more um, effectively. Uh, they also have a, a significantly larger filter area. Um, so there's a much higher dust capacity than some of these standard um, US MOVE panels. And they're the type of panel that we have um, available uh, here in the EU and the UK. Um, I think that's it. Uh, was there anything else? No, I think so. Um, I think we'll move on now, actually. Thank you very much, that, Stefan. That was awesome, actually. Um, and obviously, you'll have some questions to ask, some technical questions for us both at the end, really. So we'll, we'll carry on with the presentation. Um, it, it's, we've, as, as you all know, probably, uh, we've all had an uphill struggle with trying to get um, um, both the nature of the disease and obviously any treatment of it um, done in the UK and the rest of the Western world as well. So. Um, it, it's been a very lonely path we've had to tread, really. And uh, but um, despite that, we've had two really, really good success stories. Um, um, the first one was in Kerrigan County Council, 
where they are um, now um, building, um, the children themselves are building devices. Um, they started in one school and they built 35 devices yesterday, I believe. So, um, so the, the little elves have been really busy. But on top of this, um, both counties have produced good documents. Uh, I would say uh, the Cerdigion document is slightly better than the Carmarthenshire document. Um, Carmarthenshire at the moment have gone down the route of um, delivering professional devices um, to their schools. Um, and unfortunately, they've gone down the route of um, the Blue Air devices. And I'm sure Stefan will uh, fill you in on the, the problem with the, the Blue Air devices. But um, they've delivered 42 of those devices to the schools. Um, Keredigion have gone down the route of Cozy Rosenthal Thomas. And um, so once, once, once the report from um, the school is completed, the, the plan is to roll it out throughout the whole of the county. Um, it is going into a super school, as they call it in Keredigion. Um, it's a very large school. Um, so um, we should have some interesting information actually over the next few weeks and months really from that school and hopefully um, um, a CRT devices will go out through Carmarthenshire, but we're, we're hopeful that it will go through Carmarthenshire, sorry, um, as well in the next few weeks as we are in discussion with the new county council there who are much more open to um, DIY devices than the previous council was. Um, right okay um and yes i I'll show you so this is the, this is one of the good news stories we had on the bbc where um um some of our devices were built down in Clenetley in a school in Clenetley. and this is a new build school interesting enough um the other devices which had gone in in the county had been in, in all schools and of course all schools are at, at an advantage with uh, airborne pathogens in that they're very leaky but new schools are, are not very good at all because they're sealed, they're sealed environments. And uh, we were surprised really at the condition of the filter really after um, only being in the classroom for three months. But anyway, um, you can see this story now from the BBC. Made from a high powered fan and some special filters with a little help from Dr. Rhys Thomas, a consultant at Glanguil Hospital. He's already developed a breathing device to help COVID patients, which has been used in Bangladesh. I saw Dr. Lucy's work um, online and in the papers doing some air purifiers. So I contacted him um, and thought it would be a good idea to have. That's spread through the air and also learning the ways of building a um, air purifying machine. Professionally made air purification devices can cost thousands of pounds, but the raw materials for this device cost just over a hundred pounds. And the inventor says it can have a real impact on air quality in our classrooms. So we've got a very powerful fan here on top here. 30 units will now be trialled in primary and secondary schools in Canada. Gion. I came up with a device along with colleagues in America to um, make a simple device but yet very powerful which is very cheap which the children could actually build themselves to help themselves plans to use ozone machines to disinfect classrooms were abandoned by the welsh government last year after safety concerns these homemade air purifiers are very different and use filters to clean the air it takes the clean air into the dirty air into you and it cleans it in and sends the clean air up it is quite easy to make as long as you've got the right equipment. It is really, really fun. But I feel really safe, feel really happy, uh, free there after all these lockdowns. It's very nice. I feel safe in the classroom. A school of life for less says it's seen fewer cases of the virus since the purifiers were brought into the classrooms. Right, and... Um... This is the uh, the YouTube video we've got up um, on YouTube, obviously, um, shows uh, basically how to build one of these devices. Um, we got it in Welsh and English, obviously, because it's uh, bilingual, it's compulsory in Welsh. Well, they go to 
we go there to make a box and that's the base for the device. Yeah, so that's the base of the device. So we take this, uh, these together now, to make sure there's a nice seal so no air can come through through the gaps and all the air has to go through the filter and that will create the base uh, for our filter. So the good thing with this device is that we reuse all, uh, all the packaging that uh, the uh, parts have come in. Um, so the, the cardboard that the filters came in, we cut that uh, piece of cardboard down to the size of the base. And, and that is the base for our device then. Um, and actually offers the thing is then is wasted uh, from everything that's arrived. Right, so the easiest way to build this cube is to carefully tuck the corners together with a little bit of tape, ensuring, of course, that the arrows point inwards on the filters. We take all, all four sides, ensuring that it is completely sealed. And the seal is so important because the eye, the air preferentially would go through the gaps rather through the filter because it's less resistance. Um, and once we've got that seal, then, then we can ensure then that all the air goes through the filter. And then that's actually obviously been cleaned then um, with the filter. Once we've created that, you can see we've actually got quite a stable structure here. So we're stable enough so that we can actually put the fan, which is going to go on top. The next step is to use the cardboard that we saved from the packaging to make the top and the base for the Corsi Rosenthal Commerce filter. Um, so I'm just going to mark out the size here. Now, you need two of these. One to make the base. That will be stuck on again using gaffer tape. And then we need another to make the top of the filter box when we turn it over. So the next stage is to cut a hole to take the fan to go on the top of the box. And I'll do this by marking out the center as I've done already here. And then I'm lucky enough to have a trammel to mark the circle. But you could easily do this with two pencils and a piece of string um, or take them to a ruler and mark out the circle. Then carefully cut out the circle. Uh, so what we usually find is, is if um, if they if they say it's an 18 inch fan, then this circle actually the diameter of the circle would be about 20 inches, just for you to have an idea of the size for the cutout even. So this is going to be the base um, for the box, and then this is going to be the top where the fan sits. So it's important again when you're putting the bases on that this is completely sealed, uh, all four sides, to um, to seal the base so no air can come through the base. So we're going to put the top on. Uh, the important thing is only to seal three sides first before you put the fan in. Okay? Um, it's important that you leave one side free so that you can pull the cables out. So this is the last thing we're going to do. So um, you take the fan out of its packaging and then place it on the top. The other important thing to do with this um, when you insert it is the put the correct setting on the speed of the fan. And what we found is uh, that the, the lowest setting is more than enough. But also the advantage of having the lowest setting as well is that it's going to be quiet and it's key actually for the children who are learning this. One of the final bits then to do uh, um, is to take the fourth side down, the final side down. So um, one final thing to do to make sure that the fan is actually in place and sealed and held in place is to tape around the sides there. Hold it and the easiest way I've found to do this is to cut your tape in small sections and then gradually work your way around, ensuring that there's a good seal all the way around the fan. So the type of fan we're using is actually quite important, we found um, with the experimentations. Um, and that these are high velocity four fans. They throw a lot of air and they're very cheap to be able to buy as well. So that's it. Um, so that, that's the complete unit. Uh, so this is uh, this is a cozy rose little Thomas Davis, as we were just saying just now. And um, yeah, that's it. Really simple and incredibly powerful. Um, this throws less than 54 cubic meters of fresh air through the room. And when you compare it with a competition, you know, so as Dyson said, it only throws 70 cubic meters. It's incredible.
Right, great. Well, um, that's come to the end of our talk, really. Um, right, that's come to the end of our talk. Um, I hope you really enjoyed yourselves. Um, um, we've had a, a great time doing this, actually. And uh, But it just goes to show that, you know, we we proved we could make a device that a six-year-old could build, which would deliver a six-room air circulation for around about £100. That actually, as it turned out, it turns out it's actually probably the best device on the market as well. Um, I think the key thing for us, um, we're pushing for this, certainly in Wales, to be put into the Welsh curriculum uh, for children and that the children get to build these devices every year um, in their school. Um, the filters um, definitely are more than happy for six months. We think they're actually probably going to be right for 12 months. So they'll only need to replace the filters in their second year, which will reduce the costs even further then. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, um, if you've got any questions to ask myself or Stefan, um, we'd be um, grateful for it. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Rhys and Stefan for that uh, talk. Uh, we will take uh, questions now. Um, and uh, I've been, uh, through the chat with uh, even we're going to uh, leave his talk for another day so we don't want to crowd this up i'm going to just start with some of the questions in the chat and then if other people would like to raise them please do we can you can raise your hands just one of the questions from from i'm not quite sure how to pronounce this demon pe anyway um uh, says are the filters of the same particle removal efficiency for I guess I guess you mean for different sizes is that right in other words do they do they remove different sizes at the same rate basically thanks Stefan that's a good one for you yeah um so in terms of um the particle filtration rate um they're uh, EPM 155 percent so that means um particles below um one micron uh filtered at a rate of um 55 percent according to the ISO standard um uh Draymond, uh, did point out that I have made a typo in the ISO standard there should be 16890 yeah. um in terms of H14, um, that's a HEPA filter standard, uh, H13, H14, um, under the um, ISO and um, EN regulations of um, what you would classify as HEPA. Um, for EPM 155%, um, the old standard would have defined it as a, an F7 filter, and the US equivalent is the MERV 13. So it, um, it is a lower particle filtration rate uh, through the filter. Um, the idea with the DIY devices um, is not uh, necessarily single pass filtration. Um, that doesn't need to be made clear. Um, it's about um, particle reduction within the space. Um, so through multiple passes through the um, filter, um, through a high flow rate, um, that's how the um, cater is uh, being defined in terms of the flow rate times the particle filtration efficiency. Um, but it, it is an important definition between the retail units and um, these DIY units. Um, it's one of the reasons why um, this works in terms of um, low pressure drop across the filters and the um, off the shelf fans um, that it enables a very efficient high flow rate and particle reduction rate. Yeah, I mean, just uh, as, a, as an aerosol scientist, can I chime in? Please. Um, so uh, if you tune in next week, you can watch my talk and essentially uh, what we can show just is explicitly measuring with an actual optical particle counter what the filtration efficiency is as a function of specific and distinct particle sizes in actual real classroom environments. And like Stefan said, it's the combination of the total flow plus that filtration efficiency. And it's the sum of those parts that defines your clean air delivery rate. So, um, and, and so we can do it with explicit measurements and, and prove that it, it's outperforming the HEPAs, um, or we could do it with theoretical back of the envelope calculations with assumed deficiencies and, and get the same answers. Okay, thank you. That's a good advertisement for next week, which we'll come back to at the very end. Um, okay, uh, so Joe Pajak has a question about uh, whether the teaching unions are supportive and involved. I wonder if you've uh, got anything to comment about that. Yeah, um, they've been noticeably quiet, actually, to be honest with uh, the teaching unions. Um, we've had 
very little anything to do with them. Um, we were lucky with Keradigion in that we had a very supportive um, teacher uh, who was also worked in uh, craft and technology. Um, and yeah, and this, the school headmaster and everybody else was really supportive, but also the health and safety for the local authority was very supportive of what he has done as well. So because obviously it has had to go through their health and safety really. Um, so no, uh, but uh, apart from, we've had no, nothing, no dealings with the teaching unions at all. And it, it's, it's, it's really strange. It's really strange. I think Hilda, you made a couple of comments in the chat about this. Maybe you'd like to comment, would you? Yes, I'd just like to say we've been, the Houses Campaign has been working with the teaching unions and other school unions for a very long time and had a role into that joint uh, document that um, Reese mentioned earlier. And right. I have been right from the beginning trying to make people aware of the DIY revolution and give them that information. And I should just say that it has really started to take off a bit now and I think we will see a bit of movement. But I, I would I would say that teaching unions are, but you know, they, there is an interest there, but they're in a really tough position of feeling worn down by, by the whole process, by everything that's going on as far as COVID is concerned. But there is interest there and it's growing and we're trying to cultivate it. Okay, that's well, that's encouraging. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, Pete Knapp, you've got your hand raised. Would you like to ask your question? Yeah, thanks uh, for the noise in the background. I, I'm really happy uh, to see that you've done this. It's exactly what I was trying to do, <laughs> uh, making a, a, a DIY a purifier for schools so that stu students could learn about the benefits of air quality. But I found that the one thing that was different between your approach and mine was that you, you, you were using an axial fan and I was using a centrifugal fan. And I want to know if there was the reason for why you chose the axial, because that is high, high velocity, but low pressure. Whereas when you want to go through a filter, you want a low velocity, but high pressure, which comes from the centrifugal fan. It's also a, a little bit quieter, but then as I found, they're really much more expensive. So I wonder if there was any other reasons why you chose to use the axial over the centrifugal fan. Yeah, I, Pete, thank you very much. Uh, excellent question. And it, it did it did occur to me, uh, and I'm sure to Stefan as well. It, it's just, it was cost and availability. Uh, it was the biggest thing. Um, I, I know um, the type of fans you're talking about can be a little bit quieter, but probably not at the velocities we're talking about, you know, so uh, the thousand cubic meters, mm, you know, so that was the reason we went down, you know, what could I get off Amazon basically for next day delivery as cheap and as available as possible. That's, that's for how we started. That's how we started. You know, I, I probably wouldn't have been able to go down your route kind of thing, but it did occur to me. Yes. So no, good question. Okay. Uh, there's a, another question in the chat. Um, from uh, Dement uh, saying, do you think rapid recirculation of air may help spread distribution of airborne infectious particles? And I guess this, this uh, perhaps I could add my supplementary question to that, which is, I mean, it's, it's all very well, I think, to say that you pass through a certain volume of air in a certain time. It's not obvious to me that that all the air in the room passes through the filter in that case and there could be areas that are never collected by a fan for example i just wonder what your thoughts are about that yeah um it, it's an excellent question and it has worried um some people actually but I, I think i would just take a look at history um this is what they've been doing in biological containment labs uh, for the last 60 years and okay except for one or two mishaps um it, it seems to work really well a lot of biological container labs just rely on um, airflow only um, and nothing else. Um, the better ones rely on um, filtration and UVC. And actually, I, I, that, that's what I do in the house here. You know, I, I, use, I use UVC for the upper room emitter, which is cheap and cheerful, and it's absolutely amazing at killing pathogens. 
but I, I supplement it with a um, with a um, with a high flow filter, which circulates the air faster and takes out particles. So um, you know, um, it, it's there's a there's a lot of different ways you can do this. Um, um, ideally, each each room needs to be assessed really. Um, but the advantage of what we've got is that we've got the advantage of maths with us, in that it's it's so powerful, it's so over. Uh, over engineered for what it actually needs to do that actually sort of does away with any uh, any other problems you might have. Uh, the, I like to put these in places in the dead dead air spaces in 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 school classrooms where there isn't a window or a door um, to help to really help the recirculation of that dead air that's in that uh, in that room. And then you know um, if you've also got a door and window open, then it's it's only going to get better. So um, yeah, probably not um, a complete answer, but uh, for history, that's what people have done, and it's worked really well. Uh, Stefan, is there anything you want to add to that? Probably. Um, yeah, that that is one of the th uh, reasons why we um, went down this route uh, with um, the larger flow rates. Um, so in terms of um, promoting mixing within the room. Um, there are uh, previous studies um, that I can um, provide in the chat in a minute that um, show that when you uh, have um, large spaces around you know, 100 um, meters cubed, um, you need to get up to larger flow rates um, uh, in excess of uh, around 500 meters cubed per hour to sort of promote the mixing within the space. Um, and with the DIY um, solution as well, the, the CADA values that we've shown there, that's the filtration through the unit, um, but that's 75% um, of the flow um, uh, on the charts that were shown. So there's an extra 25% of flow on top of that. Um, this is one of the arguments with the Dyson air purifier in that it has a lot of bypass flow to promote mixing within the air uh, sideways um, in order to bring particles to the unit. Um, and uh, I believe, uh, Professor um, Javier Balser also did a test within the school with a single panel DIY air purifier and showed that um, uh, there was within a five to 10% um, mixing um, uh, factor that he just, uh, evaluated within a space of 170 meters cubed. So uh, with smaller devices, it certainly is um, an issue and you want to be more distributed, um, putting them either end of the room or um, uh, you know in the middle of the room between people. Um, but if you're trying to promote uh, mixing within a, a large space, then the large flow rate um, helps greatly with that. Okay, thank you. Um, I just have one other question, I think, uh, which is that uh, one of the things that we're involved with in um, in dealing with schools is, is the role of carbon dioxide monitors. Um, and one of the issues that we seem to see is a, is a lack of, a lack of knowledge on the part of teachers about uh, about ventilation and the role of carbon dioxide, for example. And I wonder whether in trying to introduce these into schools, you come across similar barriers from the point of view of teachers being too busy or or not having the knowledge and understanding to uh, to deploy these uh, devices. Yeah, um, I, th I think we've come across every level of stupidity, really, to be honest with you. Um, I, I think people don't realize that um, a CO2 monitor is just a, a risk monitor, but it, it's, it's not one that's um, linear. Um, so if it's, if it's going above 800, you know, they think, oh, yeah, I'm still OK. Um, if it's going above yeah, 1,000, 4,000, oh, I better do, yeah, I might do something about it. But it, it's not like that. Technically, you only need one viral particle to land on your on your nose, throat, or lip uh, for you to get COVID. So, um, so it doesn't work like that. Um, yes, okay, it, it's, it's a temporary canary in the, in the coal mine and stuff. But at the end of the day, um, you know, what you need is excellent filtration um, and ventilation in, in, in the classroom. Um, that's the key thing about it. And even if your CO2 levels are, you know, um, below 600, I would still recommend having a HEPA filter device in that room anyway. You know? um, especially as the as the virus now is getting uh, fitter and uh, clingier to humans, um, it's 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 only going to go in one direction really. So um, I I'd I'd start moving away from CO2 monitors in future. And just one, I think, final question again from Dimit. 
uh, says, do you use PM 2.5 air monitoring to show that the air is being clean, cleaned? <laughs> no, obviously. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, so the CO2 has got nothing to do with uh, filtration of the air. So, no, not CO2, PM 2.5. Do you use oh, PM 2.5? No, um, we haven't. Uh, uh, we haven't got any experience of it, and this is something that Evan will be talking about because um, there isn't currently any devices out there that I know of which is of a reasonable price which you can actually use. Um, so we haven't actually yet, but Evan might have the answer for that in future. Yes, absolutely. Okay, I think we need to uh, bring the discussion to a close. Uh, um, uh, so I will, um, just to say that, uh, first of all, let me thank Reese and Stefan for their presentation. Um, it's really inspiring to see kids involved with the construction of these devices. And, uh, and also I hope that, um, uh, that they'll get involved with the science as well, um, as time goes on. I think that's a very positive aspect as well as the fact that uh, it may reduce uh, infections in the future for all sorts of airborne disease, not just uh, COVID, of course. Um, so thank you both very much for the presentation and for the for time. Um, just to say that uh, next week, uh, we will have what was going to be the second half of this week, but uh, uh, I think we need to give a bit more time. So even Cross is going to speak uh, so, sort of part two of this, of this uh, presentation. Uh, next Thursday, the 26th uh, at one o'clock. Um, and we will circulate the information about that and uh, the Zoom link, of course, in due course. Finally, I think to, to say uh, thank you all for joining the seminar this week, and I hope you're to see you again next week. Uh, for those of you who would like to know more about Tapas, Kat has put her uh, email address in the chat. So please feel free to email her um and uh, and again thanks you everyone very much okay so with that i'll say goodbye